welcome uh, to everyone joining the MedTech webinar series version 4.0. My name is Vinayar Namal and I'm a former Global Innovation Fellow at CCIT and I'm also a biomedical engineer. So allow me to give a brief overview of our series for those who might be new to the community or who are joining for the first time. We launched a book back in 2021, that's AKU's first ebook called MedJack. It contains all the experiences of CCIT encompassing both the highs as well as the lows. It's been co-authored co by a total of 14 co-authors and each time during our webinar series, we use a chapter of our book as a conversation starter. We invite our panelists and we provide them with a chance to sh uh, share their journey around innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship that we love to call as ICE. With that, I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for today's session, an accomplished uh, medical professional with a diverse and impactful career. He has been the co-director of CCIT at the AKU. Uh, her expertise also extends to sleep medicine, uh, having been a sleep specialist at the Sleep Center in Karachi. Her varied experiences across different aspects of healthcare, combined with her commitment to critical and creative thinking in medicine, make her an ideal moderator for today's insightful and forward-thinking discussion. With that, I would like to also introduce our uh, panelist, uh, Sayed Wakas. He's a fourth-year medical student at Aachan University. He's not just a dedicated med uh, to medical studies, but he's also med uh, making a significant stride in uh, healthcare innovation. He's the co-founder of Pink the Tech, a breast health tech startup aimed at revolutionizing how we approach breast health. Additionally, Sayed Vakas also has a passion for fitness and medicine. So his creative outlet <laughs> is the Instagram uh, channel called Sports and Futures. And then we have Mr. Amir Ibani. I hope I've uh, pronounced the name correctly. Thanks. He's a final year medical student uh, at Aga Khan University, Amr has leveraged from social media platforms like YouTube and Instagram to document and share his medical student journey, gaining thousands of followers and millions of views. His work not only educates, but also inspires a broad audience, showcasing the life and the challenges of a medical student in today's world. Thank you, Amr and Vakas for joining on time as well. And a pleasure to be over here. To you. Over to you, Dr. Marie. Thank you for that introduction, that lovely introduction, Zunera. So um, um, all of it, you know, as Zunera said, it's about the book that we launched back in 2021. We pick a chapter of the book and then we base a discussion around it. And we would love to know um, the personal journey around ICE, innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship of our guests here. The chapters that we've chosen today um, for our panelists are chapter eight, <clears throat> Text linked to innovation, the road to immorality, uh, immortality, not immorality, <laughs> um, whereby we discuss the importance of tech in terms of tech being used for innovation, entrepreneurship, for creativity, the use and lack thereof. Does one need to be or one need to have high tech um, involved in their startups or can they also do with low tech? Along with that, we've also decided to choose chapter four of MedJack as a conversation starter. And chapter four is around incubation, hatching eggs in the innovation ecosystem, where in the book, we've discussed our concept of business incubation, keeping in mind that we launched this concept in a healthcare organization, how CCIT launched it, what were our successes, what were the things we had to, you know, sort of remodel, redefine, and would love to incorporate that with your journey. So for that, I will move on to the first question. And my first question will be for Vakas. So um, Vakas, you know, you have a startup called um, Think Detect, which is a breast health tech startup. has been incubated with the NHI2, the National Health Incubator Program, which is a partnership between AKU and AKTN, uh, Accelerate Prosperity. So with that, considering the incubation model as discussed in chapter four, how can digital platforms like Instagram be leveraged for health education and promotion in the context of health, in the context of breath health awareness, in your opinion? What do you have to say? So um, first of all, um... That was a really wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, thank you for hosting us. Thank you, Dr. Mary, and thank you, uh, Zanera. Um, Dr. Asad is uh, unavailable, I believe. But uh, yeah, thank you to everyone, everyone, all of you, the team. 
and uh, my team is also so Hasnan and Mahim. They're, they're going to be joining us. So they're going to wait on the clinic, but they'll be mm -hmm. here in like two minutes. So sorry to keep everyone uh, waiting. But yes, so as, as Dr. Mayun said, uh, you know, that uh, I have, I'm one of the co founders for Pink Detect and also have an Instagram channel, which is known as Scott and Sutures. The, 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 both of these both of these creations are fairly um, new um, but but I'm working on them and um, so how can uh, I believe the question was okay, you know how can uh, I can link incubation with breast health awareness and how I can use digital platforms so well we we know that there's a global burden of breast cancer there is both morbidity and mortality which is impacting communities worldwide and in certain regions such as ours, they, they exist taboo to you know, surrounding surrounding breast health. And it is unfortunate that there's denial of care for many women based on the fear of uh, bringing shame to the families. And so to, to bridge this gap between this lack of awareness and the crucial need for medical assistance, um, we, we can live with social media platforms. And within the realm of social media platforms, we have, we have Instagram. And it is it is invaluable, you know. The 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 key lies in conveying messages smartly and appropriately. There there are cultural differences, and we should be respectful of those. Um, you know, they play a significant role, and so our approach, I think, it actually reflects uh, that we use strategies to disseminate information in a more culture friendly way. And this is also one of our um, unique value proposition here at Pink Detect that, uh, you know, we give out material that is not explicit, that is not sensitive. And so it is, it is not a barrier for women to reach or to gain this sort of information. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, as much as I, as I like to say that social media is invaluable um, to increasing awareness, there, there is obviously uh, the challenge of misinformation, um, you know, uh, at Pink Detect, one of our the education blogs that, we, that we're making are mostly aimed at uh, mid-buster, you know, there, there are multiple bits of deodorants can cause breast cancer or, um, you know, mobile waves can cause breast cancer. And so these, these myths are present there and uh, we can either eliminate them just like further continue on them more through internet and so over here at Helping the Tech, our, our idea is that evidence-based information uh, that empowers individuals to make informed decisions should be prioritized and should be disseminated. And yeah, so that's that's pretty much how we can utilize digital platforms to spread our information in a much more healthy and effective way. Great, thank you for that. Um... And and appreciate the fact that you know, a how you said that it's important, but it's up to you how to use it, or you know, whether to use it for your benefit or how much to use it, and then and then the cultural appropriation, which you know revolves. With that, I have another question for Amir. So Amir, based on um, the incubation and innovation themes in chapter four. How can social media platforms, you know, same question for you, be effectively used to document and share the journey of a medical student while fostering a community of future healthcare professionals? Same question, think, but with a different, you know, true, aspect. True, true, it. true. Um, uh, I really like what Waka said, especially the 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 part where where you don't like his his uh, thing not showing explicit content. Um, it's a very unique twist to. Um, spreading awareness. But yeah, with regards to my, uh, with regards to answering my question, um, I think the, the issue, I mean, with, with, with any, uh, startup or with anything that, uh, that, that gets started, um, there's always these, uh, there's always these hindrances. There's always these hiccups that come up with, um, with, with anything in life, I, I do believe. And I think, with a lot of the uh, students and a lot of uh, med students in this platform, um, when applying to med school, I think um, not knowing how to apply to med school, not knowing when to apply to med school, um, not knowing what med school like is, um, I think that was a huge, uh, uh, I think, 
back in like 2019 and even before that, um, there was very few platforms where you can effectively know what a day in a life of med school student was in Pakistan. Um, and I think um, Random and More was definitely one of the very first few um, channels out there that really um, showcased that um, in Pakistan, in Karachi particularly, um, I think we were able to really um, showcase um, how to get into med school, number one, and then number two, what it is actually like. Um, and I think that was the biggest thing that we were able to accomplish. I do believe that because of uh, perhaps our channel, um, um, we were able to, uh, I wouldn't say glamorize med school, but I do believe uh, we were able to really uh, make it a accomplishable thing. Um, it wasn't like a daunting task no more. Um, applying to med school or getting into med school or even being in med school. It, I, I, I wanted to convey the message that med school is somewhat relatively doable. Um, it's doable getting in um, and then it's doable just uh, surviving through med school. And I think um, just uh, having that community of people that do believe that, you know, okay, yeah, this is doable. Getting into med school is easy. Not I wouldn't say it's easy, but doable again. Um, getting into med school, surviving med school is uh, doable, and I think that was something that uh, that that's that's really um, um, well done by I think not even on not only my page but even Squad and Suture is showcasing what med school is actually like. Um, uh, the recent video that you guys uploaded was extremely extremely wholesome. Um, just just humanizing this uh, whole med school thing is what we really really wanted to do, and I think that was the thing. That we really that that is the thing that we really enjoy doing. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that. You know, um, what you've essentially also demonstrated with your answer is how an entrepreneur's mind functions. So identifying a problem, there was a need. There were there was no other platform doing or delivering or telling you about, you know, how to get into med school or Tell us how to do that, you know, at a local level, or even if once you do get in, what happens next? So that problem, you identified it and then addressed it. That is essentially, you know, in a nutshell, what an entrepreneur's journey is like. Um, so thank you once again. So with that, we have two other guests, um, and I would go ahead and just introduce them in the interest of time. So we have with us Mahin uh, Zahid. She's a fellow fourth year medical student at AKU. Mahin embodies a unique combination of medical acumen and artistic talent. As a photographer and wedding photographer, um, she brings a creative eye to the world of medicine. Mahin is also involved in squats and sutures, contributing her skills to this innovative Instagram page. Hi Mahin, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you for how you know joining our webinar. Um, with that, I'm gonna jump on to a question right for you. Sure. So, you know, if I were to ask you to reflect on the importance of storytelling, um, which is demonstrated both in chapter fours and chapter eight, right? How can visual media like photography and videography enhance the narrative of medical education and patient experience, in your opinion? Um, so I think something very interesting um, that I've seen as a medical student, especially in the past one year, um, which was our clinical year, um, is that every patient has a unique story to them, um, doesn't have to be uh, as a type of disease. It's just that the way um, the way they present, they always have some kind of personal touch and a story to uh, who they are. And um, I, I, they, I really like talking to them about that. And they all have different interests. And um, I think photography is a, is a very nice way to uh, show someone's uh, personality. So I don't know if you guys have seen that page, but Humans of New York. So basically, they take pictures of random people of the community. It doesn't have to be someone very popular, someone very low-key, but they still have so much essence to their personality. Um, and everyone has a very unique and inspiring story to share. So I think photography can really help you get to that level of the community. 
Excellent. And and if I were to, you know, categorically or specifically aim it at um, medical education or or you know healthcare, how do you think you know where does where does photography fit as a, you know as a mode of showcasing or presenting the narrative to say the masses? So um, I think one major thing that photography covers is awareness. Um, that too about specific, specific diseases which are more prevalent in um, a certain community. So in our case, for example, in Pakistan, um, diseases like TB, hepatitis, breast cancer are very common. And um, due to the literacy rate, a lot of people don't know many things, but a lot of people do watch TV and read the newspaper. So if you take pictures and it ends up on media, then that eventually creates a really big impact and people are, uh, you can really get to that level, um, not at like a medical level, but like at the level of a layman's knowledge uh, and help them really understand to look for the red signs of any disease. And that is something very, very important um, because prevention is definitely better than cure. And as a photographer, I would love to deal with that. Um, creating a lot of awareness videos. For example, during the COVID-19, we had so many videos um, and ads playing for vaccinations, clearing a lot of myths. Um, and I think that really helped out. So just to just to add on to this, I mean, mm -hmm. I just remembered, you know, in within ATU, within the clinics, and uh, you, you have these clinic walls, and which is like, pure white wall it's, it's a small room and you have a lot of equipment within the clinics within the clinic rooms there, there are pictures of doctors who are photographers who, who've taken pictures and they've, they've posted these paintings uh, of the pictures onto these walls and so i i don't know like how much it in, it enhances a, a patient's experience of their visit to the hospital but like you know these, these small acts of like a photography, you know, a doctor who is also a photographer and they posted their pictures on the wall. I mean, it must have some sort of influence on the patient experience and, you know, maybe calm them down or something. But yeah, that, that just humanizes what also, also what we said before, humanizes the whole experience. One hundred percent. I no, thank you for that, Vikas. And I also tend to agree because, you know, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So maybe there is, you know, stuff that a doctor can't convey or say, but that picture might be able to, you know, if left upon the interpretation um, of the patient, you never know. Um, with that, I would, moving on, I would we have like, to another, add yes, Mahin, would you like to add something? No, it's an error. <laughs> Hello? Am I on the phone? Yes, yes, you are on. Okay. Yes, I just wanted to add, uh, because the conversation was going, and I just wanted to add a way, as a non-MBBS uh, like person, it really helps us humanize you doctors, because there's this uh, preconceived notion that doctors are supposed to be perfect. And like, you know, when we are going to a hospital, doctors are seen as, from the lens of someone who's, who's just going to have all the answers. But you, what you guys are doing, Scots and Sutures and Random and More, what you guys are doing is, you guys are telling your story as if like you're making yourself more relatable or doctors more relatable to uh, people who are not from medical backgrounds. So that's a great job as well. Excellent points, Anera, because, you know, I agree that doctors need to be humanized too. People need to understand. Um, thank you for that. So with that, I'm going to introduce our fourth guest for the webinar today. Hasnan Mantani, who's here with us, is joining from the Aachen University as a fourth year med student. Hasnan is also the entrepreneurial mind behind premed.pk, an edtech startup designed to support and guide aspiring medical students. His work exemplifies the blend of medical education and technological advancements. Hi, Hasnan, how are you? Hi, Maureen, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm very well and good to have you here. So with that, in light of um, the entrepreneurial and incub... Am I breaking up? Is my voice breaking up? Is it okay? Yeah, it's, it's okay now. It's up. fine now. Oh, yeah. All right. Tech versus human Sundays. Um, 
So, okay, back to the question. In the light of the entrepreneurial and incubation strategies outlined in chapter four, what challenges and opportunities do you foresee in the ed tech field, particularly in medical education? Um, firstly, uh, thank you for having me. And secondly, that's actually a very great question. Um, I happened to read the chapter and um, it was quite interesting where it mentioned about um, incubation and how every uh, small startup or initiative um, in its um, primitive state has a very high chance of failing. But then um, I think that um, through experience, I learned that you have to firstly ask for help. You know, um, incubation literally helps that, you know, uh, a small initiative that does not have the necessary resources, um, it contacts with the right people it goes to the right um, authorities and then tries to set it up um, self quite well. So that's quite important. And same with like even the medical um, healthcare system, as you mentioned that, you know, in terms of incubation. So I think that um, if you look at the digital era, um, things are quite um, opportunistic, I would say, in the sense that we are seeing AI, we're seeing chatbots. So a lot of people have been asking that, you know, oh, doctors will be replaced and how will uh, things be working? And I think um, in this, we have to look at um, the entire scenario from both sides, uh, from both perspectives per se. One is the perspective that, you know, again, um, we know the numbers. Uh, doctors are missing, for example, in Pakistan, the numbers and the ratios of doctors to patients is not being maintained quite well. So we need to, for example, work on that. And then these AI chatbots, these machine learning um, softwares will be helping that. And I feel that any startup that comes in this domain uh, will be excelling at it because it'll be actually um, serving just the, not the cause of monetary uh, benefit, but also um, the healthcare and the humanitarian benefit as well, um, per se. Um, again, I would say that, you know, the other con of this is that, you know, often people say that uh, if you, for example, are going through pattern recognition, there's also the chance of errors. But I think that even to err uh, is to human as well. So humans are also capable of making mistakes. At the same time, I would say that, you know, the machine, um, through these machine learning um, habits and analysis is going to be making us, our lives actually easier. So the incubation, I would say, is the way it's going to work is basically rather than, for example, humans rejecting the technology completely and saying that, no, uh, we will not be accepting it. What we need to do is basically make a merger. We basically combine that technology to our benefit, to our advantage, and use it alongside our clinics, our practices. So it actually helps the patients more than anything else. So I think that's what the future holds for medicine, healthcare, and incubation. Great. Excellent answer. And I couldn't agree more, you know. Just like, just like the pandemic, for one, taught us how technology easy, could be used. Easy. Oh, shit. Okay, I would request the participants to please mute their mics. Everyone who's here. Um, so with that, yes. So, you know, the pandemic taught us how even by sitting at home, we could still be connected. Just as we're connected in this webinar, we're using a, a platform to be able to talk about, um, you know, your startups, spread awareness, spread information. Um, with that, moving on back to Vakas, I have another question for you. So Vakas, how can the principles of startup incubation um, be applied to scale Pink Detect? That's a tough one for you. It asks about the scaling of Pink Detect for a greater impact on breast health awareness. What's your plan for scaling? So yeah, this this feels like an investor day. <laughs> I'm getting asked the questions about pink detect. So well, as I brilliantly mentioned about how incubation can help uh, startups gain the right resources and obviously <clears throat> reach their potential, and and that is the sort of sort of idea that we want from our incubation. So we're incubator, national health incubator, as you mentioned before. We're also incubating in a Western Union Foundation program. So both of these uh, incubations have been instrumental in in how we are sculpting our startup and how we're moving forward with it. So the incubation chapter uh, it also says along the line that you know incubation is where the startup is really at its vulnerable state. Uh, different things are being tried out, investors uh, are approaching, and the founder, the team is trying out new avenues, new strategies to you know, implement new techniques into the, into the program. Um, right now, I don't know how much funding or support I pull in from the investors uh, who will be interested in us, but I know, you know that in every opportunity, Pink Detect, all of us, we, we will learn. 
we will learn through all the opportunity that has thrown at us from these incubations, from all the mentorship, from the guidance, or what is given, we will absorb all of it. And uh, we we have gotten a, a bit of grants, obviously monetary value through these incubations matter a lot, you know, uh, that has gotten to work on the progress, we're building the app and everything, but uh, what what lies in the future, I can't say really say. Obviously, with, with the monetary support and with the correct guidance, we, we have ideas for scaling. Uh, I agree. Oh, yes, okay. So obviously we, we have ideas for scaling and uh, we can scale. So for one, of our, one of our ideas is that we will add uh, AI modeling into it. So for this assessment from West Cancer, the, the different models that exist and we're, we're sort of trying to utilize how AI can solve that issue. We, you know, AI can give a risk value. And so, so you know, AI, AI is expensive. And as, as I mentioned, AI has pattern recognition has errors. But uh, we're, we're trying to sort that out, we're trying to figure that out. So that is that is one thing that how we want to scale. Obviously, uh, yeah. disseminating the app worldwide, globally, you know. If, oh, I was, I was muted. We heard most it, of it, just yeah, the last five heard, seconds. Yeah. Uh, Okay, well, I, I would say that, you know, we, we, we have, I want to scale and then the, the different scaling techniques, making it accessible, make, uh, making it available in different languages, that, that is also one of our goals. And, you know, adding more aspects into the, into the app, you know, we, we want to shift from just breast cancer to breast health, you know, the physiological functions of breast, with breast feeding, with those sort of trackings that are available. And, so yeah, that's that's the idea behind uh, using incubation that to sort of scale the the product. Good luck with that. And on that note, I would like to share this with the audience. Um, that if you have any questions, you can you know put them in the chat space provided, and you can ask each one of the four participants that we have here as guests on the webinar. Um, if there are any you know, queries, any comments, anything that in particular you would like to ask, please put them in the chat space provided. Um, with that, we're gonna move on to Amir again. So Amir, um, how can the lessons from chapter eight about patient interaction and empathy be shared through your social media platform to benefit future medical professionals. Yeah, so with regard to this question, I think I think as as to be medical health professions, hopefully soon in the year. Um, and I think I think with like, for example, the 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 example given in chapter eight, the pain free, uh, the needle one, uh, Ibrahim Sajid's uh, uh, startup, his whole idea about, uh, the pain-free needle. I mean, the core concept behind that innovation is to, it, yes, kids are scared of needles, and um, you you want that. But the, the 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 core concept of that is to put the patient's fear away from um from from coming to the doctor and getting an injection done, right? And I do believe that um, with 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 anything medical, with anything um being doctor, um, our or our our, the whole point of our existence, I, I do believe, as as doctors to be, is to ease pains, ease the pain of of any patient, right? And I do believe that um, by by uh, empowering them with the knowledge of um, of of certain like disease, for example, or or just empowering them with um, anything, um, uh, whether it's um, how a uh, uh, how a CT scan is performed or how an MRI is done or what a doctor does or what an OR is like. So with in, in the coming few days, I am um, um, I was thinking of uh, uploading a bunch of videos on a daily basis on just syndromes, uh, different medical syndromes, and just educating the people about different medical syndromes, right? Now, I do believe, uh, wait, we got a question. Okay, but yeah. So yeah. I do think uh, patient interaction and uh, empathy um, 
as long as like I, I think I'm rambling at this point, but uh, if we are able to like just disseminate that information that okay, this is what's coming up, this is what so like again I'm I'm not getting I'm la I lost the train of track, <laughs> but yes. Um, if we are, I, so you I were telling us that. about, you know, your the series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No the problem. series that I'm coming up with. Sorry, apologies. But yeah, series the series I'm coming up with. Yeah, so it's it's a series of videos on syndromes. Um, just talking about different medical syndromes. So Down syndrome, uh, Tourette syndrome, um, Cri du Chat syndrome, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, patient or people knowing about it is people knowing about it and not knowing about it makes a difference about how uh, it's, it's conceived, right? So um, I do believe that with social media, it just becomes a lot easier just disseminating that information. Okay, okay, um, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what it is. This is how it's supposed to be tested. This is how it's supposed to be treated. And I think just disseminating that information is a thing that we're supposed to do on social media. And um, interactions and empathy, yeah. I, yeah, if we can move on, I apologize. No, I, I just thank you. I, that, was, that was like a that's brilliant. very well said. You know, it all. I think it all begins with empathy. And no, sorry, we lost you for a second. Yes, go on. Oh no, I was just I was just saying that you know, I mean, did a brilliant job explaining. how we want to add on the educational awareness into the into the social media and the spread the spread awareness in any way. So just you know that's that's brilliant, and we we'd love to contribute as well. Uh, you know you can you can ask Scotty Suitcase to come and <laughs> collaborate with you as well. I mean we we love to do that. Yeah, good luck. For sure, yeah. All right, thanks. I think um the question in the chat space was I think Hassan could take it, and I'll still read it out to the audience. Um, so Zala says, how much time is enough to get perfectly prepared for? MD cat, and what should be some of the tricks to not get demotivated? Hasnan, what do you think? She thinks it's she not having Insta. What do you think? <laughs> uh, so that's a very great question for every, I would say, pre medical student. This comes in the head of everyone. Um, I told her that you know she should check out pre med for that. <laughs> but apart from that, I think uh, as far as the motivation is concerned, that's very very important because um, it's not a sprint. It's not like your regular A levels or your um, enter. It's like a very long exam. It's a big stretch of exams. So what you have to do is basically just not uh, think about it too much. Uh, follow channels like, you know, Scott and Suture and Random and more because um, it sort of keeps driving you as well. You know, sometimes there's going to be days where you just start questioning as to why, you know, you started this entire journey. Your friends might be applying abroad and you're the only one here left in Karachi. But uh, or like, you know, Pakistan. But then uh, I would say that, you know, you see, um, you know, I have spent around three and a half years um, at AKU in a hospital setting. It's just amazing uh, diagnosing the tough cases. And then, you know, for example, uh, breaking the sad news and then also counseling the patients that, you know, their uh, disease or their syndrome can be treated as well. And then, you know, seeing the final result as well when they go back home. Uh, I was in ortho, for example, I would see a patient with like, you know, dislocated shoulders and all, and they would go back home all smiling and it would be a very nice feeling. So that's what really um, is the motivation factor. It's not easy, I would say. Uh, getting in is not easy. Going through it is also not easy. The post-graduation um, aspect of, you know, as medical student is also not easy. But then just that smile on the patient's face is really uh, what makes life good. Uh, someone else has also asked a question. Um, I'll just answer that as well alongside this. Um, I find myself star reading books, articles on startups, thanks to you. Um, how do you plan on juggling your startup alongside residency? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so the first thing is I was talking to all of my colleagues over here as well. And it's a very big question as to whether I want to pursue residency or not. Um, the I'll answer this as well as to a lot of people might think that, you know, oh, you're wasting so much money at AQ, a seat at AQ as well. Um, the reason for this is that um, through our website, we've essentially helped around 60,000 kids prepare for the MDCAD, uh, become doctors all across Pakistan, um, and just in three years. So I just feel that, you know, if I've been able to, we've been able to actually make such a big impact uh, in just three years. The amount of people I can help through our website, through technology, is just insane. 
So that's the exponential growth that I want to go for. Um, I was talking to Vakas as well the other day. And, you know, maybe as a doctor, you can treat maybe a thousand, fifteen hundred patients per year. But then, you know, if you're like training the next, like, you know, entire generation of doctors of Pakistan or globally as well, that's um, a significant impact that I want to go for. So as far as the juggling aspect is concerned, because we are talking about, you know, um, not the, the good part is basically that you have to basically do your thing as well. You know, if you like medicine, if you like, for example, photography like Mahi, or like you know for example uh gymming like vakas for example you have to also continue to pursue that it's not that you just have to get stringent about one thing that's very important and then at that time you also have to learn how to for example manage and delegate tasks and also for example know your priorities you know some days for example you will have to you know put your head down and study for med school as well and some days when you are free for example or you have to make time for yourself then you have to go out and you know carry on your other uh, interest as well because uh, as Vakas mentioned you know we've seen doctors uh, who are just you know workaholics who are just in the hospital but at the end um, it does give you satisfaction but you also have to have satisfaction coming in from other avenues as well sometimes that uh, satisfaction just from medicine might not be there on some days when you have a bad day when a patient for example does not recover the way that you want them to recover so you need to have that outlet as well so if you think of it like that you know that these are your ways to basically de-stress as well it sort of really really like you know helps out and as far as that you know you have to keep going uh, you have to keep praying as well that you know things work out and then if they don't then you have to have a good support system to just be there for you that's very important as well thanks Asman. and with that um, we do have a question for Vakas I believe Vakas there's a question in the chat space that they want to know about your initial funding how did you raise the initial funds which is an important question. If anyone here is considering the idea of a startup, funds become an actual issue. So, Akas, tell us your story. So, well, I don't know if it's, if it was directed at me or Hassan or anyone else over here. But well, the 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 way that we went with Pink Attack was we applied to different programs. There was a Western Union Foundation program that got us a couple hundred dollars, and then we started off with that. There were a, couple, a lot of cold emails. In fact, when I find the co-founder, so how she, she she's good at typing and she's good at uh, writing stuff down. So it was it's it's her job up till now until now. Yeah, she's just writing, churning out emails day in day and night. A lot of cold emails. Uh, it eventually landed up to one of an uh, one of the investors. They liked the idea. They invested it uh, in us. We got a, a couple thousand dollars in funding. Uh, we we utilized it, but but that's the sort of idea that we went forward with, you know, uh, cold emails and applications. There are multiple applications. There are a lot of uh, there, there's opportunity hub. I believe there is a website you can go on to the website and it'll tell you about all of the different application incubators and accelerator programs that are happening. And so you can just apply and then they they, they give you mentors and they give you guidance and there's also also going to be a more entry value associated with them so yeah that's that's basically how we started out uh, i don't know how how we're going to go in the future there are more uh proper pathways and uh, i think Hassan has can can tell more about the yeah. pathway that he's also incubating in that incubation center so he can tell more about to that. add on to that um that's a very very good answer vakas i think cold emailing really does work uh, the way that Vakas mentioned. So I'm incubated at this um, amazing incubation center set up by the government and a private equity firm by the name of National Incubation Center. Um, I'll send the link on the chat as well if someone wants to check it out or just search it on Google as well. Uh, NIC Karachi. It's amazing. It's an amazing place. You know, it's an amazing uh, workspace. And I just love going there. Honestly, it's just a good time to like, you know, communicate, connect with other uh, startup entrepreneurs as well. And at the same time, you know, it's an amazing office space as well. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing. So Vakas mentioned, you know, going for grants, mashallah, he's gotten a lot of grants already. Um, I want to mention as to how we started pre-med because a lot of people might think that, you know, a website like ours uh, might have taken a lot of monies and like, you know, that goes in the lakhs, not like even thousands either. So I just want to mention that the way we started was basically um, in our first year, uh, we talked to our coder who was actually a fellow batchmate of mine at AKU, Umar Mahar. And uh, so he gave us a quotation of 1 lakh rupees for the entire website. And trust me, if I go this and go and show this website to any developer, they would have cost me easy, like, you know, 15, 20, 25 lakh rupees. But then, you know, we found a student who was very passionate on working on the website. And we were like, sure, let's go work on it. But then what we realized was that, you know, we had just gotten into university, my co-founder Fahad and I, and we had no money. 
So I still remember like, you know, that uh, my Kala was visiting from the US and what I did was that I basically stole some money jo meri ammi ke account mein tha, you know, to my own account. And that's how I got 50,000 rupees from my own end. Uh, if you ask my friends back in first year, I would not have food in AQ. I would just like, you know, just go on, keep fast like every day. So that I would like, you know, save my pocket money so that I would have some money to pay to Umar Mahar at the end of each month. That's how I, you know, made that 50,000 rupees. And the other 50,000 from Fahad, who's my co-founder, so he is a medical student at Dow. So he had sort of done this jacket business over there and he had made some profit out of it. And that's how he pulled in his 50,000. So this is how we started. And, you know, it was a very interesting, like, you know, when we look back, we just realized that this entire website was just made on one lakh rupees, which was just a mammoth of a task. And uh, it's just interesting to see that, you know, a lot of people say that, no, you need a lot of funding. You need to, for example, be incubated somewhere. You honestly don't. If you have the drive, if you have a good problem statement as to what you're working on, Honestly, just start working and you will find the relevant people along the way. Uh, I met Fahad because I did not get into AQ my first year. I went there. Uh, we both had this passion for reapplying to AQ. I actually did reapply as well, got in as well. And that's when I talked to Fahad, you know, that I have this idea. Let's start working on it. And it's just been a journey uphill since then. So you don't need the money. You don't need those incubations. What you do need is just that drive and passion to keep working on the hard days. I completely 100% agree. Yeah, with Hasnan, what Hasnan said, you don't need the money, you don't need, you just need the motivation, the thought, the idea, um, you need the right surrounding people around you. And, and after all, you just need a little bit of like innovation to, um, with, with photography, video, uploading videos, anything, social media, it just requires a little bit of idea and a little bit of support, I think, and a hundred percent agreed. No, you don't need expensive equipment. You don't need exp uh, like expensive, um, expensive expensive stuff to to get things started yeah great thanks um just a small note yes Hasnan, great i would highly recommend people not to steal um but the other way is sure <laughs> let's not promote stealing <laughs> no, so I, I still have that documented that i have to pay my mom back so i did tell her and then uh, she was like you know so i would consider that your it? first salary that you give to your parents. I was like, Chalo, that's also done and dusted. So then, yeah, I did that, okay. give that back to her as well. <laughs> so, great. So there's like an official logo. It was firstly a loan, which was later converted to a gift. Yeah. <laughs> and it, you know, yes, okay, that makes sense. Mahim, okay, you know, I, um, so yes. Yeah, I just want to introduce, uh, like, include you guys. Just a small rapid fire question, and it has to be very rapid. Okay. It's for everyone, and that includes Dr. Mahim as well. So one word to describe your startup journey, those who have it. And Vakas, it has to be fast. Come on. We are muted, Vakas. Oh, uh, I, I was saying be, bewildering. Okay, that's good. Hassan. I would say uh, sleepless nights. Oof. Okay. Uh, what's more challenging, medical exams or startup pitches? Startup pitches. <laughs> okay, that's for this one's for everyone. One tech tool you cannot live without. Tech tool. Yeah. Uh, oh, for uh, me it's definitely point. scheduled uploads. <laughs> Scheduling uploads, best okay. thing ever. And Hassan Mahin. Um, Lightroom, I think. Yeah, I thought so because of photography. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, I would say one. Figma. Okay. Figma. Oh, yeah, you're right, Hassan. <laughs> okay. Book or podcast for learning? Podcast, all the way. Podcast. Podcast. Dr. May? Podcast. <laughs> okay. Maheen? Podcast. Oh, wow. We don't have readers. Okay. Instagram or YouTube for educational content? Like, where do you learn from? YouTube. YouTube, okay. YouTube all the way. Okay. Indian uncles. <laughs> One piece of advice for aspiring medical YouTubers. I think get over the the the, the initial like fear of um, being uh, made fun of, and then it's an easy like process. Okay. I would say show both sides of medicine, the the tough part as well, and the fun, enjoyable parts as well. Mm -hmm. Whatever Amir said, because he's the YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hardest part of documenting your med school journey? 
Um, I, think I think for me, it's it's okay. Mahin, you go ahead. It's okay. You can yeah, go ahead. No, it's okay, Mahin. You can go first. Um, so when you make some content and you realize later on that, you know, it looks like it's something very happy, but you might be really stressed. I just sometimes feel that kind of guilt that we're painting the wrong picture. <laughs> we're actually mm -hmm. stressed. <laughs> okay. Really, really. Uh, I mean, you were. I think for me, it's definitely um, like, you know, uh, without uh, showing patient identifiers, uh, maintaining the privacy, not showing like people in the background, it does other, um, just maintaining all that privacy aspect is the toughest part for me, at least at APU. Oh. And what is the most, most exciting healthcare innovation you've seen recently? This one for everyone. So I just stumbled upon a website that scans doctors' handwritings into uh, a more, it scans doctors' handwritings so that a normal layman can do it. I saw an AI-backed uh, electronic health record system. I really like that as well. Okay. My name is Dr. Nain, you have anything to say? For me, it's, it's definitely it has to be like those non uh like those treatment that weren't meant for a specific thing but now being used for a specific thing so that, for example like contextualizing Zempic, yeah, wait. yeah exactly those type of things those are always so interesting to read up on okay okay last one this one's like ai and medicine overhyped or future essential oh it's it's essential um there's there's this uh there's i forgot what it was called but there's this uh chat bot which uh, you can just search up something and it pulls up different research papers and just gives you an answer Illicit. based on those yeah. research papers. So th those type of things are interesting. Essential, essential. Yeah, for sure. Everybody is on board with the essential part? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now you can continue with the conference. Great. Thanks, Anera. I enjoyed the rapid fire round. I like I liked listening to, you know, those answers. Um, can the can the audience please mute their mics? Just a request. Okay, so with that, Mahin, I would like to, you know, hear more from you. I don't think we've asked you enough questions, so I'd like to hear from you now. Um, so, you know, in what ways can the concepts of patient-centered care from Chapter 8 be visually represented in photography and videography, and how? I think, realistically, this is a really tough question because you can't really show the patient's faces. Um, although I love portrait photography, and um, there's a lot of emotions, um, there are a lot of emotions in this field, but because of... Uh, confidential confidentiality reasons we can't really work on photography in this field um although i think if something is like acted out it can create a bigger impact on other healthcare platforms um especially uh, the patient and doctor interaction uh, how receptive a doctor is to the patient's questions how patiently they are dealing with their queries and how empathetic they are to their struggles and just uh, portraying all of that at a bigger platform doesn't have to be actual patients could just be an acted out thing could really impact other organizations to practice the same um i want to mention i think mine was working on this project with a friend of mine where um, they were basically documenting um Two things. Number one, pathologies um, of the skin. So dermatological dermatological um, pathologies on dark skinned individuals, because um, often, for example, our literature usually does um, only comment on, for example, stuff that's seen um, on a lighter shade. Uh, that's, for example, like, you know, spots, for example, or like, you know, melanomas or anything. And when I realized that, I think it was very impressive because... Um, in clinic, uh, you know, we have to, like, you know, identify uh, everything. It's not just, for example, uh, the routine, uh, you know, checkup of every patient. I think that was a very interesting that Mahin was working upon. And secondly, I think also um, in terms of, for example, like, you know, anatomy, there have been, like, some great individuals working on, uh, for example, you know, models. But then I think that with AI and, you know, for example, uh, the VR system coming up, what we can also work upon is making um, visual systems for, like, surgery and, like, other specialties. That's going to help things a lot as well.
So photography does play a role in that as well, I would say. Great. I, I do agree with both of you. And thank you for that, Hassan and Mahin. So Mahin, I do have, you know, out of like curiosity, what, what kind of like, you know, photography do you do? I know you do wedding photography, but then the other, what, what, what composition do you capture? So as I mentioned earlier, I'm I'm more, more interested in portraits because I like that human uh, essence and um, I think every portrait tells a story. Um, so I prefer candid. So even at wedding events or graduation portraits, I like to capture natural moments because they really capture the expressions and emotions of that certain moment. Um, so I, I'm going to be doing a graduation shoot very soon for this current graduating batch. Um, and it was a lot of fun last year as well because their families were here. So it was really emotional and, and nice to do. So with that, um, in the interest of time, we're going to move on to our final messages. I want each one of you to share, you know, one message for or everyone who's listening, for people who will be listening to the recording of this session, one message that you can give to future students, entrepreneurs, innovators, people who are interested in creativity. And we will start with Vakas. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm put on the spotlight. Okay, so, well, one one message that I can give to future students and uh, people on the same boat as me, would be to not worry. Things will pan out. Things will pan out, and uh, it'll be fine. I I am a firm believer that you know whatever happens happens, and uh, I'm also pretty chill. <laughs> but I just want to let everyone else know as well. Be chill in life. I don't know. It it all works out in the end. So that's that's my message to everyone. Don't don't stress. Excellent and. Um, Hasan. Uh, so adding on to what Bakas said, so stay chill, number one, and also take a learning out of everything that happens in life. So in the sense, if it's a good thing, learn, you know, what went right. And if things don't go the way that they, that you want, then just know that, you know, whatever happens, happens for the best and always learn from it. So learn from your mistakes, I would say. Great message. Learn from your mistakes and failure sometimes is good. So to be okay with failure too. Um, Mahin. So I think everyone has at least one thing that they connect with. It could be anything. It could be art, music, um, anything, right? But doing medicine, when you're doing medicine, sometimes you tend to forget what you really liked in the first place and you forget to give it that amount of time. But especially for medical students, I think never give up and go for something you always liked alongside with medicine and do not compare yourself to other people because everyone is very different um, and everyone has different interests and um, you can never have the same path as someone else and you will be very different always. That's a great message. Like, you know, um, celebrating individuality and celebrating uniqueness. Everyone is unique. It's okay to be you and it's okay to, you know, identify your skills and your own weaknesses. Great. Um, yeah, so I, I believe that with how things are going on in the world, I do believe that having um, an extra skill um, that can be obtained through mostly like even YouTube, um, learning how to edit, how to edit a video, how to uh, edit a, a photo. Um, all these things are so essential in these time that um, it's, it's, it's something that you can so easily learn and so easily pick up, um, mostly from YouTube. Um, I think it's essential just learning up anything at this point. Um, where if you can uh, learn how to uh, photograph, uh, do photography, uh, edit a video, be a social media influencer, um, do uh, be a social media manager for someone, for example. All of these things are so essential um, alongside the path that you are probably taking. Um, and it, it just helps, um, it helps out uh, both, uh, I think, confidence wise, entertainment wise, and even money wise. It just helps out in all aspects. That's a great message, too, you know. Um, I loved it. 
with that, over to you, Zanera. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope the audience enjoyed as much as I did because it was a very insightful session. Yeah, I learned about the entrepreneurial resilience, perseverance, and most importantly, like money is not the conversation starter when it comes to entrepreneurship. It's resilience or perseverance. That's what I got. And it's been a pleasure having you all. Ami, Wakas, Hasnan, Mahi. Thank you. And I hope like best of luck for your futures and Best of luck with your startups. And thank you so much, Dr. Mirin, for moderating the session. And thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to the audience. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Bye. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mirin. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Ms. Zanera. Yeah. Thanks. Have a great evening. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good luck.